Welcome to A Scientist Walks Into a Bar. I'm your host, Amanda Thomas, and today we're talking about the science and history of whiskey. We'll describe the ingredients that go into whiskey, some of the chemistry of what happens during the distilling process, and some of the differences between American whiskey and the whiskeys made in other countries, such as Ireland and Scotland. And it's not just the E in how you choose to spell the word whiskey. Our guest is Sailor Guevara, who is a brand ambassador for Uncle Nearest Premium Whiskey, which is based in Tennessee. Their distillery is inspired by the life of a man named Nearest Green. You may have also heard of another whiskey brand from Tennessee called Jack Daniels. But Jack Daniels wouldn't exist without Nearest Green, who was the first black master distiller on record in the U.S. It's a story of slavery, emancipation, family connections, the legacy of traditions brought from Africa with enslaved people, a very determined woman from L.A., and the push to encourage diversity in the distilling industry all based around what I think is a very tasty beverage. Even if you don't drink alcohol or like whiskey, this story is an important piece of American history and commerce that's really only recently been coming to light. If you are a whiskey drinker, well, this will give you even more things to appreciate about it. Here's my conversation with Sailor. We are here today with Sailor Guevara, who is the brand ambassador for Uncle Nearest Premium Whiskey. Welcome, Sailor. Hello. Thanks for having me. So glad you are here today. Me too. Can you tell us about yourself, uh, what you do, what a, a brand ambassador does? Yeah, sure. So what a brand ambassador is... You are the walking, living, breathing brand wherever you are. We also call ourselves steward of the brand as well, just because this is a person's legacy that was alive and and with us and his family uh, works with us as well. But um, I'm really just uh, walking around talking about the beautiful legacy of Nearest Green and our whiskey and telling our story. So I guess you could just say I'm a storyteller. That's great. And I have a lot of questions and a lot of story I'd like to get to today. So sure. I'm looking forward to it. I'd like to start with the science of whiskey. Can you talk about what whiskey is, what the ingredients are, how it's made, where it came from, all of those good things? Yeah. So um, whiskey can be spelled with an EY or just a Y. And typically that means that it is distilled outside of the U.S. or in the U.S., let's say, because I live in the United States. So typically American whiskey is, is with the EY. And uh, there are some uh, brands that don't use that. Maker's Mark, for example. Scotch whiskey, typically always with just the Y. Irish whiskey can be both, actually. And then you'll find Japanese whiskey, which is an upcoming category, will be spelled like Scotch whiskey. So when I'm writing writing about whiskey. If I do the EY, I'm talking about American whiskey, Canadian whiskey. Um, If it's without the E, then I'll say uh, I'm talking about scotch, typically scotch whiskey. But we're going to talk about bourbon today because bourbon is American whiskey and Uncle Nearest Whiskey is bourbon plus. We're going to get into that a little bit later. So I'm going to say bourbon a lot just for the purposes of today, of what we're talking about, this discussion. So it's essentially a spirit that's distilled from fermented mash of grain, at least uh, less than 95% alcohol by volume, which is 190 proof. And it has to have the taste, aroma, and characteristics generally attributed to whiskey and bottled at no less than 40% alcohol by volume, 80 proof. So that's essentially what bourbon is most American whiskey. Scientifically, whiskey is a complicated mixture of hundreds or even thousands of compounds, but we're going to focus on the three, which is water, ethanol, and an aromatic compound called guayacol, and that gives you a smoky flavor. And we'll get into flavors as well. So the first thing that you want to do if you want to make whiskey is choose a grain. And your grain is going to make a huge difference to the, your flavor, to how maturation goes down. So barley typically has a nutty flavor. Corn is going to be sweet. Rye can be dry or some say spicy. And wheat is going to be bready. And so that's really how you're going to choose your dominant grain. Now, if you're making bourbon, your dominant grain has to be corn legally. It has to be at least 51% corn. So mostly corn in there certain products are called straight. They have to have be X amount of grain that's in the mash bill and a certain proof level. But um, going just going back to the, the grain, you're going to choose what is grown near you, right? That would have been the origin of our spirits is what's growing around me and how can I utilize it? 
And so um, nowadays we get to choose, right? Whatever we want, depending on what we want to make. But the origin of our distilled spirits is literally, was it grape? Was it fruit? Was it a grain? And we are fermenting it, we are distilling it, or we are brewing it if we're talking about beer. So barley was really the trailblazer. Um, It's the original cereal grain used to make whiskey in specific. And it's the most often processed into a malted form. Corn is native to American. And so, of course, that's the dominant grain used in most American whiskeys, although that is changing, which is really exciting. Uh, We're seeing more rye whiskeys on the market and we are seeing more barley whiskeys, malted barley whiskeys on the market. And actually, rye whiskey was America's first whiskey, not bourbon. Bourbon comes a little bit later as we started moving out into the Northwest Territory. But uh, if you're in Massachusetts, if you're in New York, Pennsylvania, Virginia, you're going to have rye grain and wheat there. So while high in starch, if we're talking about corn, which makes bourbon, corn is very tough. So high temperatures are really needed to get the right starch extraction. And if you process it correctly, you get quite a bang for your buck in terms of alcohol production. So you're going to first want to mill your grain, right? So you can do this in several different ways. Um, Now, obviously, we use modern milling systems. Um, Back in the early days of human distilling, we were probably mashing it with rocks or pestles. Then we were milling it using wooden wheels that were powered by water typically, or we could have had a farm animal walking in circles, pulling those two big stone wheels that would go in opposite directions to mash the grain. And mashing is breaking down the starch in that grain into sugars. And then the starch stews in water to yield a good mash. So then it's producing a sugary liquid that we call wort, which can be used in the next stage of the process. Then the magic, and for me, the first rock star comes in. And there, there's some argument about what is more important, your mash bill, which is the grains you've chosen and what the percentages of your grains are. So we're using, you know, 60% corn and, uh, you know, 40% malted barley or using mostly a rye. That's called a mash bill. It's basically your list of grains that are in there. Your yeast is going to create your fermentation, right? So fermentation is a metabolic process that produces chemical changes in organic substrates through the action of the enzymes. So we add the yeast to the wort and that turns the sugar into alcohol and the exact yeast will have an effect on your final taste. And so my school of thought and from what I've learned from people that I have studied with and learned from the yeast is going to be more important to flavor than the mash bill. Really? Interesting. It's a, it's really interesting. And there's a great example that to me is kind of like a drop the mic example. So there's um, a brand of bourbon called Four Roses. They have two mash bills and 10 different whiskeys. Guess what the difference is in each of those different whiskeys versus the two mash bills? I'm going to guess it's the yeast. <laughs> yeast strains. Boom. So you'll see on the bottles you know, VSO or VO. And that means that's their yeast strains. And you can actually go online and Google it and kind of get a list of what all those letters mean. And once you learn it, you've got it. It takes a minute to figure it out. And then, you know, some taste, you get this apple flavor in it. Some has a banana flavor in it. And we're going to talk a little bit about Jack Daniels. And they're known for having a banana profile in their whiskey. Now, These are not always easy to get if you're new to drinking whiskey, just like anything when you are beginning to drink wine or beer or whatever spirit it is. It takes time to really get past the dominant base flavors, but the yeast is incredibly important. And, you know, mash bills, grain bills, we will share with the public. Yeast strains are proprietary. There is a reason. So for me, that just ends the argument right there. Right. Yeah. So for me, this is the first magic is the yeast, right? So, okay. So we have fermentation happening after the fermentation. The alcohol percentage in the wort goes up between five and 10%. And at this time, it's, this is where you're getting a difference between distilling and beer, because now you're going to actually distill what you've got from there after that fermentation. So we now refer 
it to a wash and it's transferred into the still. And um, the distillation process is pretty simple. Um, a lot of us that took, I took very basic chemistry, not knowing I would end up doing this for a living. So I can't pick myself, but <laughs> you know, we had little, we were distilling in science class, you know, with your little tiny beakers and so forth. So it's the process of separating the components of substances from a liquid mixture by using selective boiling and condensation. That's it. It's pretty simple. Um, you can do this with a pot on the stove. And that's actually how a lot of early distilling happened. It would be two pots with something that would take that steam or that condensation and move it over and separate it. So from what we know of history, the first distillers were women. That was the case for a very, very long time. Distilling was a kitchen product, basically, just like canning, just like all the other things, you know, churning butter, um, making cheese, curds, whatever it was that you were doing way back in the day before we could go to grocery stores. Same thing with your distillate. And so before we get into the next step of this, I just want to talk about how common distillates were. So if you have a farm and you, let's say you have 20 acres and it's just for your family and you hope to sell a little bit of that grain to a neighboring community or a supplier in town and you have an excess grain one year, well, that grain, you can't hold on to it very long. We don't have Tupperware. We don't have, uh, you know, steel drums, things like that. So you risk the grain being eaten by vermin or molding and going bad. It's just a waste of precious hard work, time and money. What you can do with that grain is you can take a cup of grain milled and we're going to make bread with it. We're going to take this cup of it and we're going to still with it. You're going to get 10 times the product that you would against the bread and probably 30 times the money for it as well. So it made sense. Wow. I didn't realize it was quite that different in the, the quantity of output. Yeah. Huh. Very, yeah, very, very different. So, you know, like you can sell grapes and a lot of people will eat the grapes and that's fine. Are they eating grapes every single day? Probably not. Maybe, maybe a couple grapes. Are they going to drink a bottle of wine daily? <laughs> Highly probable, let's say. You only have four glasses of wine in a bottle. So let's say you sit two people down to eat and you give them some a bowl of grapes and you give them a bottle of wine. They're going to consume more of that wine most likely. So it's kind of the same philosophy. So if you find out you can take this excess grain and make booze with it, woo, why wouldn't you? You're going to figure out how to do it and make it yummy, right? Hopefully. And then if you, even if you can sell it even better. So you keep a jug for yourself and then you can sell a few jugs to your local tavern or just your neighbor's. So this was a really, really common process. So most millers, once we got to the point where someone had to actually be milling grain in larger quantities and you probably brought your grain to a miller and then sold off the rest of it, fed your livestock with it, um, the miller would get paid in grain, not money. I've just milled grain from 50 people this season and I have this excess grain. What the heck am I going to do with this? You know, I'm the miller. Oh, I can distill it. So the millers often were distillers also. And so we'd say back in the 16, 17, 1800s. So women were called, I'm sure you've heard beer witches before. So we were making all of these products that again, were just like kitchen products, like churning the butter and distilling the whatever it was, brandy or a wine or a beer or whiskey. Just another method of preservation. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so back to distilling. So just like you could do in two pots with something that transfers and separates, that's basically what you're doing. So the alcohol you want from the process of distilling is going to be the middle part of it. We call that the heart. So you have four shots and then you have the tails and you want to get rid of the four shots. That's going to be the methanol. And then the tails are just going to be bitter and not so great. That's where the talent comes in. How do you know without computers? How do you know exactly where those hearts are? Well, you're going to learn at some point by doing some measuring, figuring out the heat, figuring out how long. Think about what that took back in the day to figure that out, especially if you don't have gauges on your stills, if you don't have uh, steam that can be piped in and out, uh, modern pumping systems. I, I have a lot of respect for early distillers because it would very much be a I can feel the humidity either in the place where I'm distilling or I can stand next to it or feel it and it's this temperature and it, there's a smell and I just know. So if I'm understanding you 
let's say you have a, a pot of the item that you are distilling and you have to know, okay, there's enough steam has come off that you, the, the first stuff you don't want, enough has gone off that you can uh, use the middle stuff and then you know, have to know when it stops, but it's not actually finished boiling yet. Yes, okay. exactly. Um, so the hearts are what you're looking for. So a couple ways you can determine this is your four shots are going to come out at the lowest boiling point. So usually they would go, okay, it's at this temperature. I know I'm at my heart, my beginning of my heart. And then you're going to lower that temperature and then that's the tail. So again, it's really just about, you know, nowadays we have computer systems and everything's, you know, automated and all of that. So it's very easy to know this. But before all of that, you just, it's like my great grandmother who is green and she taught me to cook and we would try desperately to write down her recipes and it was a little of this and we'd be looking at in her hand and I'd be like wait 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 don't put it in the oh she put it in the pot I can't even take it out and measure it but it would taste exactly the same every single time and so it, it's it would have been very similar process to that figuring out um you know and, and all of it, you know, did you get to choose your grains for a long time? Most likely not. You know, how do you get the best fermentation so you get the most liquid to come out? You know, that bang for your buck. Um, and then you have to figure out how to filter it. And filtration is really, really important. So you're going to store this whiskey in wood barrels or wood containers. And actually, some of the first laws written about whiskey in the United States state that it has to go into wood containers. It doesn't say barrels because there were boxes as well. Really? Can you imagine having to carry boxes to a place for it to mature rather than rolling barrels? It didn't last. It was kind of like the fruit crates almost, but enclosed. Crazy. Um, Interesting. Okay. I didn't know that. Yeah. So you're going to mm -hmm. go ahead and you're going to you you typical method is you're going to just take it right out of the still. You're going to put it into the barrel. Now, these days, you have some rules about it has to be X amount going into the barrel. It can't go into the barrel higher or lower than this proof, and it has to come out and be this proof. And that really just depends on the type of whiskey that we're talking about. Typically, let's say for our purposes today of bourbon, you're distilling around 70% alcohol by volume, and then you're diluting to 40% to go into the bottle. That's typically what's happening. So you're going to go ahead and place your whiskey in oak barrels. Again, we're talking about bourbon, so it must be oak. And you're going to put those barrels into warehouses or rick houses, as they can be called, because they're on ricks. Instead of just being loaded up on the ground floor or stacked on top of each other, at some point, someone figured out if there's room to breathe between these barrels, if they're off the ground, we either want them higher or lower because we want them to get more heat or we want them to get more moisture or you know, we want them to be cooler. So that depends on how tall we're going to build our warehouses, how big. And where are we going to store them? So that's a really important factor because the majority still today of barrel warehouses are not temperature controlled. There are some um, that are temperature controlled and use metal barns and then pipe in steam heat, things like that. You can absolutely do that. That is much more expensive, but you're probably going to get maturation a little bit quicker and it's easier to control what's happening. Let's say if you have a couple bad summers while your whiskey's aging or a lot of ice storms or something like that, all of this affects the flavor of your whiskey in the end. It also affects how much whiskey you have. So if you're in a very dry, acrid place, once you put your whiskey into the barrels, by the time you take them out, let's say four years later, you're going to lose more of that whiskey and that evaporation we call angel share. So they used to say God came in and blessed the barrels and the angels took their share and everything's fine. And, and that's just evaporation because it's a wood product, right? And the, the, the barrels breathe? Yes. Yeah, so uh, you're having temperature changes. So that barrel is expanding and contracting and expanding and contracting. And in that, you can be losing some liquid. Literally, it can, when you walk into a barrel warehouse, you can smell the whiskey because it's wood and it's porous, right? But also you may getting, you know, tiny trickles out of those barrels. It's not 100% airtight and watertight, right? You know, the trickles may lead to a cup after eight years, so you're not really going to worry about it. And then also, yes, the evaporation, because it will either go into the wood and then be pulled out of, you know, your tiny, tiny little air holes that you have um, in between your staves. 
So really what's happening too inside these barrels is you've got natural... So natural oils are very essential for whiskey making. It's a lot of where your flavor comes from. So for example, oak casks are full of naturally occurring oils called vanillins. Very important to whiskey. Very important to rum. Very important to aged tequila, really any aged spirit. And then you're looking for tannins to come out of those barrels too. And that's where you get some of your color. So you get a little bit of your color from toasting and charring these barrels. And so that is a process that has many, um, there's many reasons that we do that to barrels. Number one, that was a way to clean the barrels. So imagine you're sending over a ship from the Caribbean to Boston in, let's say in the 1700s, and you brought over fish in the barrel and you dump out that fish or it was pickles or gunpowder, and then they would reuse the barrels. Well, you want to make sure that you don't get contamination of flavors, forget other things, right? The best way to clean them was to burn the inside of them. And you can do that, believe it or not, over and over and over and over because your staves are several inches thick. They're actually quite thick. So you can char them up to five, six times before you're really going to get to the point where you're like, ooh, that might not be good anymore. Might not hold anything or can crack and break. So... In doing that, you're drawing out, you're opening up the pores of that wood and you're drawing out a lot of those flavors. And of course, you're going to get color too. So the two different steps of preparing those barrels is to toast them. And so you will use the long pieces that make up the barrel before it's banded together. Um, Those are called staves. And you either, nowadays, it goes through kind of like an oven situation on a conveyor belt. And those are coopers that put barrels together. Back in the day, it was just knowing, again, knowing how much fire to put in there, how long to let it burn. And then once the barrel is put back together, you're going to char that barrel. So you're literally going to light it on fire from the inside. And that's also going to help it become more water and airtight too. And that's a caramelization that's happening, just like any other caramelization. So there you get more flavors as well. So you've got heavy oils and fats and lighter esters, and all of that comes from the whiskey and the wood together. And all of this matters. So that's why the maturation, the aging in barrels is the second magic. So for me, it's all about the yeast and the barrels. What type of wood are you choosing? Um, What type of tree did it come from? You can do barrel finishes. So you'll hear a lot of times this whiskey was finished in a sherry barrel, or it could be finished in a beer or rum barrel or vice versa. You're going to pick up those flavors. Also, the size of the barrels is going to matter. So that's the level of exposure a spirit has to the wood. So if it's in a 10-gallon barrel, that maturation is going to happen so much faster. If it's a 53-gallon barrel, which is standard to American whiskey, it's going to be a slower process. But you can control it better than those tiny barrels. So with those tiny barrels, and I've seen this happen in craft distilleries. I worked in one. Um, Typically, you can only go with a 10-gallon barrel about a year. And then you're going to really have to taste that regularly. Uh, We found a barrel that had been put aside for a year and a half and got really excited thinking this is going to be delicious because it's aged longer. And it tasted like Ikea furniture. (laughs) (laughs) So it can go to a bad place. That's a visceral, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that smell, you know, when you open those damn flat packs and then you you have like that depressing sigh, like, why did I buy this thing? Um, That's kind of how I felt when I was (laughs) drinking the whiskey. (laughs) And so I, I think I mentioned when we were emailing, I, I lived in Ireland for a year recently. And so I went on a lot of distillery tours. Um, and I, I know that there are some differences between American and, and Irish whiskey and, and Scottish and, and other places. My recollection is that American whiskey barrels, it, it, it's required that they be the first time that they're used. Is that right? Yeah, first use is big in the language of what whiskey is in American whiskey. So bourbon has to be in a new charred oak container. It cannot be used ever before. Now, there's finishing, and that's kind of like skirting the law a little bit. And some purists are like, wow, 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 it doesn't mean it's whiskey, it's not bourbon anymore. And some people are like, look, I just put it in there afterwards. I did all the things I was supposed to do, and then I finished it to give it a little extra unique flavor. I am fine with it. It seems like, you know, the governing bodies are fine with it. So typically 
Irish whiskey is triple distilled. They will do sometimes two to three different casks. And so they refer to their barrels as casks. Same thing with scotch. And typically scotch is aged in bourbon barrels at some point, either the second or the third barreling as well. They age their whiskey for much longer than American whiskey is aged. So um, the minimum age for a straight bourbon is only two years. So um, we're talking, you know, your typical Irish and Scotch at the minimum is eight years, usually 10 to 12. So to really get the most use out of that barrel to really pick up the flavors. And you're having a lot less temperature fluctuations. Also, your climate is much more consistent in Ireland and Scotland. It's going to be pretty humid. It's going to be pretty cool. Um, That's not the case in Kentucky in the United States or in Tennessee. So you can have snow flurries. I, I lived there for a time. You can have snow flurries in April and it's, you know, freezing temperatures. And then literally two days later, it's 85 degrees. That's just common. So uh, you're going to get quicker maturation out of that than in a cold climate. For example, the father of Japanese whiskey, where he chose to age his barrels is in a climate in Japan that is very similar to Scottish climate. So he was looking for that to kind of replicate the process, the flavors as best he could. And so he went for a place that was colder and more humid, had less fluctuations. And so therefore you're going to have to age for, for a lot longer. Interesting. Huh? Yeah, I obviously I I learned a lot about Irish whiskey, but I not specifically about American. Only in terms of oh yeah, well we've we use American barrels uh, later. But um, this is fascinating. Uh, so speaking of American whiskey, one of the iconic brands that probably most people know if they haven't had a lot of themselves, they at least are familiar with the brand is Jack Daniels. And my understanding is that Jack Daniels was the uh, first registered distillery in the US that was established in 1866. And that is, Jack Daniels is pivotal to the story that I want to get into now. So can you talk a little bit about Jack Daniels as a, as a person and as a distiller? So Jack Daniels is one of the most globally recognized brands, period, even outside of spirits, um, which makes the story of my brand so much more incredible. Um, Jack Daniels actually learned to make whiskey by working on a farm with Nearest Green. So Jack Daniels was a self-professed orphan. His mother passed away and then his father remarried and um, he didn't get along with her, it seems. A lot of this is family lore, speculation, some things that he said. But nonetheless, as a young boy, he left his farm and went down to the neighbor's farm. Um, And the neighbor was Reverend Call, and he was a young preacher at the time, newly married, and they had a small baby. And he said, can I please live with you and be your chore boy? And they let him. So he was a chore boy on the farm. The Calls owned a small general store. Like I said, he was a preacher, and then he had a farm. And so he grew grain. And like most farmers and millers at the time, he also distilled excess grain and sold that in his general store as well. And so he could not do all of this himself. And it was typical to hire a slave at the time to do your distilling. And briefly, this is in Tennessee, correct? This is happening in in Tennessee. Yep. So here you have this farm and there's a small boy helping out and the preacher has rented a slave. He was not wealthy enough to own a slave. And also the person that came onto the farm to do the distilling was a very talented distiller. So his price would have been quite high. As a matter of fact, Dan Call had said several times, referring to Nearest Green, who we call Uncle Nearest, um, this is the best distiller I know. And that was saying a lot because there were 13 distilleries in a very immediate area to them. So that was quite a compliment. So um, as Jack got a little bit older, he was introduced to Uncle Nearest and Uncle Nearest had been emancipated and stayed on the farm to work for a wage. And uh, he said, Dan Call said to Nearest, I want you to teach this boy everything you know about distilling. And he did. And they worked together and they became very, very close personally as well. Nearest would have been much, much older, father age to Jack. And so everyone called him Uncle Nearest, which was the term of respect in that area for the family and at that time. 
So at some point, the preacher's congregation and his whiskey making were at odds and his wife was pressuring him to give up that whiskey making. But at this point, Jack, turns out he was just a genius businessman. And so he had already begun distribution, self-distribution, taking it outside of the immediate community. Um, He had already begun getting this whiskey off of the farm and creating a name around it and getting a really good price for it and doing a really good job. So he was very successful at it. So Dan Call gave him the distillation part of the farm. So Jack asked Uncle Nearest, would you work for me, please, and be my stiller? And he said, yes. And so that makes Uncle Nearest, Nearest Green, the first African-American master distiller on record in the United States and the first master distiller for Jack Daniels, which is a pretty big deal to uncover because for a very, very long time, the story was told that it was Dan Call who taught Jack Daniel to distill, that he was the one that may have even taught Uncle Nearest to distill. And there's a lot of reasons why we know that's not true. And most of this research comes from the Jack Daniel descendants themselves, the family, and from things that have been written down and from Jack Daniels themselves, the brand, their own historians. So why this story wasn't told for so long is something that we don't have to speculate. It's just, you know, a symptom of the country that we live in. Well, and I remember hearing about there was a biography of Jack Daniels uh, or Jack Daniel from 1967, I think, and where Nearest Green is mentioned dozens of times, if I remember. Over 50 times. Yeah. So it's not like he was hiding anyone. No, yeah. no, no, he absolutely would not have. As a matter of fact, if he knew what we were doing, he'd be beside himself with happiness that the nearest has his own whiskey now. Yeah, there's um, a book called uh, Jack Daniel's Legacy that was written by Ben A. Green in the 1960s. And it's the most comprehensive story with the most truth on Jack Daniels. And so it happened to be out of print when the founder of my company started researching the story. And so she was already a best-selling author and decided to buy the rights to it and write a foreword and put a new cover on it. And um, I have it in my hand. Um, listeners can't see it, but this is the new cover. It's a hard copy, very hard to find now. I don't know if we're going to reprint it, but the proceeds from the book benefit a foundation, um, education foundation for the descendants of Nearest Green. So yes, let's talk about Fawn Weaver. Who who is she and, and how does she fit into this story? So uh, Fawn is a New York Times bestselling author. She happens to be incredible at doing research. Um, her and her husband were real estate investors, business owners. Um, they grew up in LA. She's actually part of Motown royalty, which is another part of the story that is her story that's just being told with a new national television commercial that just came out. Her father is one of the most prolific Motown producers in the history of Motown. Pretty amazing. Yeah, I didn't know that part. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't know it either for a long, for a long time. Um, so she uh, happened to be uh, on a business trip with her husband. And her husband is a VP for Sony Pictures. There's a reason I'm mentioning that. And so she opens the New York Times and there was an article written by um, a really well-known spirits writer who also um, writes a lot about civil rights and especially in the 1960s. And it says a hidden ingredient was found in the story of Jack Daniels. So again, Jack Daniels, the brand, was the one that pitched this story among others to the New York Times. And that's common for brands to do. You know, every quarter, every season, here's some, you know, to get some press. And they pitched this themselves. Um, it's possible that a slave taught Jack Daniel to distill, not Dan Call, was kind of the premise of it. And so he was the perfect person for the story because it combined both of his interests. So that's the one he chose, did as much research as he could, because it's not his full time job, of course. And from what he found out, it was a pretty earth shattering story. When she read it, she was not in the spirits industry, she wasn't even much of a drinker, but she recognized immediately wow, if it turns out to be true that it was a slave, you know, an African-American that is responsible really in part for a a large part of this brand, one of the most globally recognized brands, wow, this changes so much. And this could change at the time their entire industry. Now it's her industry, it's our industry. So she couldn't get it out of her head. So when they got back to the U.S., she said, let's take a trip to Lynchburg, Tennessee. And her husband was like, nope teeny, teeny, tiny little town. And she spent uh, two full days 
in the basement at the library researching as much as she possibly could. And finally, one of the family members of the Jack Daniels family, who are the Motlows, showed up at the library and said, "Um, I hear you're writing, you want to write a story about my family. And the reason why this was a kind of make it or break it moment is that New York Times article the company didn't follow up after. So unfortunately, the comments on it and the reaction were very, very negative. And it's understandable that most people were like, oh, wow, Jack Daniel stole, a white man stole something, you know, from a former slave, from a, from a black man. And, and like I said, absolutely rightly so. If you don't have a conversation after that, they don't know exactly what was intended, what happened. So there was a lot of negativity and they were dealing, you know, oh, Jack Daniels was a slave owner. That's not true. So uh, Fawn said, look, I'm here to write a story about love, honor, and respect. And if this isn't that story, I won't write it. And that was it. She was put in touch immediately with the descendants of both Nearest Green and of Jack Daniels. And so she was able to sit with the family members. She was able to speak with them to interview his great granddaughters. Um, she was able to find documents and um, just really it, it became an obsession for her. So thousands of hours, archaeologists, archivists, you mention it. She's doing national, international research to uncover the truth and the real story, thinking she's just going to write a book about this and perhaps her husband will make a movie. Ah, hence the Sony. Got it. Yes. Yeah. That was just, that was her original intention. But the closer she got to the nearest family, the more she recognized there's money involved. There's generational wealth that was lost. There's so many aspects to this that could have been corrected long ago. And so that is the whole purpose of all of us today is to try and correct that. So she decided to create the foundation that I spoke about. Um, So anyone that is a descendant of Nearest Green can get a full ride scholarship to school just get accepted and the foundation pays for everything. And we've had 11 people go through school, masters, we've got someone doing a PhD. And then she went to visit the grave site of Nearest Green. And this is a segregated cemetery because of the times. And so Nearest is buried next to Jack, but not next to Jack. So she had a uh, monument built at the cemetery for Nearest. And then the craziest thing, She's speaking with one of the family members one day and they said, hey, you know that farm where this all started, which by the way, is the first site of old number seven, the first site of Jack Daniels whiskey. It's for sale. You should buy it. And she's thinking, <laughs> they don't, I mean, there's no way this is for sale. Wouldn't the company buy it? Wouldn't the co- would Tennessee not, would this historical society, like <laughs> there's so many people that could have bought it. You would think, yeah. Jack Daniels has a holding company called Brown Foreman. They are, you know, international, massive. There's so many a historic preservation society. I don't know. Um, nope, it's for sale. Truly, it was for sale. And so Fawn and her husband, Keith, bought it right away. And so they set out to restore that and um, were able to do even more research. And really, she was able to retell the story of Jack Daniels, the man and the brand, in a more truthful way, in addition to uncovering the story of Nearest Green. And so I think once that Jack Daniel, the company, found out, and when the family members were on her side, they were a lot more open to what she was doing. And so the next thing she set out to do was create a nearest green experience at the Jack Daniels distillery because her story was not included. You would walk through the distillery and she's like, hey, you're telling it's not the truth anymore. We know this now. There's no reason for this. And so now Uncle Nearest is included at the distillery in the story. And then, you know, it was just, well, what else can I do? What else can I do to honor this legacy? And finally, the family said, make a whiskey, put his name on a bottle. (laughs) And so she decided, all right, if I can find the right person to do that, uh, I will. And her real estate agent had mentioned to her once, hey, if you ever decide to make a whiskey to honor Uncle Nearest, I'll help you out. And they're just like... (laughs) Everybody is just a distiller in Tennessee. I don't know. They didn't know who she was. So someone filled her in and said, oh, that's Sherry Moore. Sherry Moore is A, a descendant of Jack. And B, she worked for Jack Daniels for 31 years. 
She is the former director of whiskey production. So she literally knows everything there is to know about Tennessee whiskey. Um, has trained the last, I believe, two master distillers. She'd be a great person to help you get start a new whiskey brand. Yeah, perhaps the ideal person. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't can't imagine literally anyone better in so many ways. So um, we pulled her out of retirement. And so she began that process. Then we began uh, building our own distillery, the nearest green distillery, which is in Shelbyville, which is on the way to Lynchburg. We wanted to make sure that we could serve liquor um, and have a full bar at our distillery one day. And you can't do that in Lynchburg. So really? Yeah, it's still a dry county. That's ironic. <laughs> <laughs> it's so weird. Yeah. So on the way to Jack, you see us um, right on the highway there. You can't miss it. So we have um, a beautiful distillery that's still under construction. It has not stopped during COVID. And we have three different expressions, we call them, different uh, bottles of whiskey. We're the fastest growing American whiskey brand in US history. We have so many firsts that we have like three pages on it now. So we know Nearest was the first African-American master distiller on record. We are the first um, American whiskey brand to be Black-owned business, the first bottle to commemorate an African-American. And then our master blender is the first female African-American master blender for a whiskey brand. And her name is Victoria Edie Butler, and she is Uncle Nearest's great-great-granddaughter. So... <laughs> That's wonderful. I mean, the story is just amazing. So Vaughn had the idea to do a small batch blend and each batch she would have a different descendant curate it and then they would have their signature embossed on the back of it. And so Victoria, who is now sitting on the board of the foundation, just happened to be the first one up. And so she chooses her batch. It leaves the distillery and wins like every award possible. And so they're just like you're going to be our new master blender. <laughs> and so she's been working with Sherry and learning and her bottles are continue to be award-winning as each batch comes out. So the beautiful thing is that we went full circle. So Jack and Nearest many years ago were standing together creating beautiful whiskey and now Sherry and Victoria are. So you have a green and you have a descendant of Jack also. So it's a beautiful thing. I love this story. I'm really glad to hear it from you. I had read about it and heard about it on another podcast, but this is so much more detail than I knew before. So this is wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. There's one thing that I do want to talk about separately, if I could, which is the Lincoln County process. Yes. I was going to ask you about that. That's a huge, crucial part of this story. So one of the things that differentiates Tennessee whiskey from all other American whiskey is that you have to use the Lincoln County process, and that is a charcoal filtering process. Jack Daniels calls it a charcoal mellowing. Um, but and every Tennessee whiskey that wants to call itself Tennessee whiskey on the bottle has to use that process. So it turns out that Nearest Green was the one who perfected that process in Tennessee. We know that a process similar to it with charcoal filtering was being done before in Kentucky. And we know that it comes from West Africa. West Africans were distilling beer and um, cleansing water and filtering uh, some food products with charcoal. We can trace that back to West Africa. So uh, now it's such a common process, but it wasn't then at all. And then the way that Nearest perfected it. So the first thing is that the type of wood matters, just like in your barrels, it has to be sugar maple. Well, sugar maple grows all over the farm. So that would just be the ideal thing to use. And then the way he made the charcoal himself. So you have to take the wood and you have to get it to, you know, whatever is ideal for you. Um, these days it's kind of palletized and then they burn them because you want to get it into chunks. And you have to know what you're doing when you make charcoal. It's just not a matter. So you don't just get ash because that's not going to help anything. So you have to know when to stop that fire. And obviously you've got to put something on the wood to get it to ignite and burn quickly. And so you're going to use high proof alcohol, which you have on hand, by the way. Uh, sure. right. <laughs> and then nowadays it's how do you do this process? Do you have it soaking in a huge vat? Do you have it piped through the charcoal, um, which was one early process? And how long do you let it sit with the charcoal? 
And then how does it leave the charcoal? This is all really, really important and crucial because for two reasons. So before the Lincoln County process, when you took your whiskey out of the barrel, it was usually put in jugs before we were glass bottling for consumers. And so you had to find a way to get those chunks of charcoal that could be in there just from the barrel, Mm -hmm. right? We talked about charring the barrel. Um, And so sometimes it was just a cloth. People would put a little cloth over it. And you see this kind of in mason jar when people are canning and so forth. Sure, It's a similar thing. So you're going to do a few steps of filtration in Tennessee whiskey. So it's going to take longer. It's more expensive. And it's more time consuming um, and labor intensive. So what Tennessee whiskey is, is it's bourbon, period, the end. We have to do all the things that bourbon has to do. Then we do an extra step of filtration. And so it actually makes it a premium product. So for a long time, people think Tennessee whiskey is inferior to bourbon, but that's never been true. It's always been a more premium product. It's always been a more expensive product because of that extra step. And that extra step we believe in because it is a superior flavor in the end. So obviously we use the Lincoln County process because Nearest Green perfected that and is called the... Uh, godfather of Tennessee whiskey because of it. And just to circle back, the the Lincoln County process is based in West African and enslaved American tradition of distilling. Of distilling and just filtering, period. So they figured out how to store food products in charcoal. There's so many uses of charcoal, but you see, I mean, West Africans are still producing charcoal. There's huge commercial products that still come out of West Africa because it is a tradition of how to create charcoal. I don't know what I thought charcoal was before I got into whiskey and especially Tennessee whiskey. I didn't really think much about it because you don't see it. Really, you see kind of modern looking filters and pads is what it looks like in other whiskey. And so like a Brita filter, you don't look at that and go, oh, it's charcoal. You don't really think of it like that. So when I had to learn about what exactly charcoal is and you know how it's made and why there, there's an expertise to it. So it was an interesting thing that Fawn was able to uncover. And I don't know much about the process or, or anything like that, but we do know that that's where it comes from. And we can trace that directly to African slaves that were brought over and that were in charge of the distilling process. And so another important thing Nearest Green is, as of right now, the first African-American master distiller on record. It's important to say on record because he was not the first master distiller. Everyone that had a distillery that was a commercial distillery, even if that meant for a small town where they were not distilling themselves, they would have been the business owners most likely. They may have taught their slaves to distill or they may have purchased or rented slaves that already knew how to distill, like Dan Call, for example. Whether he knew how to distill, we don't really know. It's highly possible and probable, but to have an expert in it, if you're doing a little bit larger quantity is something that you would have done. So it's important to know, just like with so many industries um, that we have, we can look back on and, and we know that it was really African-American slaves that were doing all of the hard labor and all of the work and really are responsible for much of the innovation um, in a lot of our industry. Uncle Nearest is one of them. And that brings me around to something I wanted to finish up with. I know that there was a recent announcement just a couple of months ago um, from Uncle Nearest and Jack Daniel Distillery about an initiative to increase diversity in American whiskey uh, making. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. One of the things that Fawn learned because she didn't come from the industry when she got into this industry is she was immediately faced with a lack of diversity. She was also immediately faced with that lack of diversity creates a vicious cycle and will box you out if you are diverse. So imagine being a Black woman that walks into Tennessee and says, I'm going to create a Tennessee whiskey brand. And I don't think it went over that well in the beginning. As she began to seek people to hire, obviously she needs at this point to have some of the most experienced people when she hires them because we are an emerging brand. She's realizing how difficult it is to have diverse hires. We have waited for months on some positions just to get a larger pool of diversity before we can actually look at our candidates because it's something that's very important to us. Her goal is she wants the company to look like the U.S., So she wants a mix of everyone, just like the U.S. is. One of the problems that we have is this industry does not seem welcome to, frankly, people that are not white, white men in specific. 
I am uh, in my late 40s. I've been in this industry for over 20 years. The things that were acceptable when I started would probably make the younger ladies pass out now because they were considered to be like kind of dirty industries, like, you know, very salesy and, you know. So she has been talking, you know, how do we cultivate diversity? And it has to come from many, many different levels. How do we attract more diversity in bartending? Just start off behind the bar because that's where most of us all get started. How do we create more diversity in ownership, in the production of spirits, in all of it? And so shortly after the murder of George Floyd, when the country was in you know, the beginning of the turmoil that we're still in, she sat down with Jack Daniels and said, we have to do something. We have to make a change. And now is the time to do it. So we are going to create a distilling institute, number one. And number two, we're going to create an initiative where we are going to support bringing in diversity into this industry. And we are going to pay for it. We are going to teach them. And we are going to help them either start businesses or get into the jobs where they need to be. Because companies are asking now, Thank God, you know, how do I hire more diversity? And they will come to Fawn Spirits Brands. And she's like, well, I mean, they're, they're, this is a big discussion. It's not just a one, two, three. And so this is really the best way to do that. So we each pledge $2.5 million equally to support the first round of candidates so that they could um, almost like a Fulbright scholarship in the industry. So we can help people with ownership. We can help people with um, the education and the certifications that are needed. And to be doing this together with Jack Daniels is a huge move and just long, long, long overdue. That's really exciting to hear that there's so much collaboration and so much drive to diversify what is essentially a, a scientific field of distilling. Yes. Nowadays, it may look like it's kind of like, oh, you're a rock star if you're a distiller. Nobody knew who distillers were 10 years ago. (laughs) Most people didn't care. I think it's when women started fighting for that space, when women started fighting for that position, it was a novelty. Oh, look, we have a woman distiller. You know, it's the typical thing. And you started seeing more faces of distillers and people became a little more interested in what's behind the brand, behind the product in many industries. But you're still just a chemist. You're still just a scientist. You're still just, you know, if you ha- if you do have the cert- certification of a master distiller or a distiller, or at the very least, just a science nerd, just, you know, that's all we are really. If we are interested in what's behind all of the whiskey <laughs> and how to make it and any spirit, frankly, you know, rum, tequila, vodka, wine, beer. In the end, that's really what you are, is you're excited and interested in the science and the chemistry. Absolutely. Definitely. Well, as a, as a final question, I wanted you to use your scientific knowledge and give us a recommendation for your favorite drink using Uncle Nearest Whiskey. <sighs> So funny, I just got asked yesterday if I, my last, either my last cocktail ever, or if it, or if someone said like, from now until whenever you can only drink one cocktail, what would it be? And I was like, what? I'm a mixologist. That's a, whew, that's a rough one. <laughs> uh, so two things. Number one, if you want to, if you're new to your whiskey journey, an old fashioned is really the best way to start that journey. Just like with anything, your palate has to be trained. It has to be educated. It has to have knowledge and experience. A big thing for me is the lack of women in the category of whiskey drinkers. I have been fighting that for about 12 years and I call them converts. And I hope I have helped hundreds of women at this point because I used to be behind a tasting bar in a distillery five days a week. I hope I've helped you know a lot of converts. It's like anything I would say to people, what beer, do, you didn't start off drinking an IPA when you were of drinking age in quotes. <laughs> um, you know, you're probably drinking yeah, Franzia right. <laughs> or Gallo in the jug when you first started drinking wine and you don't know any better and you have to train your palate just like with spirits. Um, you may have had a bad experience I used to say for a long time, I hate tequila because I had a bad experience when I was too young drinking garbage. Um, and it turns out tequila, is, it's, there's so many different flavors and profiles. So with whiskey, you start somewhere and you just try to learn about the flavors that you're tasting. You don't have to like it. That's it. Take that away from it and it's less daunting. Just enjoy it. Add a little bit of water, add some ice, 
If you want to add a little bit of soda to it, as long as you can still taste that whiskey, you're just giving your palate, your brain, you're getting information, experiences, and memories. And that's really important. So the old-fashioned, a really well-made old-fashioned is absolutely my number one favorite. It may seem basic to people who drink cocktails often, and it is, but there's a reason why we're still drinking it hundreds of years later. It's a darn good cocktail. So I would say get a beautiful bottle of Uncle Nearest. You really want to be gentle with all your proportions. So just do two ounces and you can do up to three ounces um, if you want to sit with it with a big cube for a while. You do about a tablespoon of simple syrup, about four or five shakes of bitters, And then you just stir it with ice. It's that simple. And as you're stirring it, you're getting some dilution. You're emulsifying your ingredients. All those oils are blending together and everything else you put in there. And then pour it over. We call them king cubes, the nice big square ice cubes if you can. And then just do a little bit of an orange peel or you can choose a cherry if you like. You're going to be tasting that whiskey. The flavors that we've added to it are enhancing some of the flavor profiles that are in whiskey already. And so that I would say is a go-to. But if you want to have something really special and unique, the whiskey sour is always the way to go. The whiskey sour is probably the drink that gets screwed up the most. I say this with caution. <laughs> um, I am not a baker because I don't like being precise when I'm cooking. You really can't go, oh, I'll just do a little bit more. You can't. It's not going to taste the same. It's not going to come out right. And with the whiskey sour, that is absolutely the case. So Google the classic recipe and just be do it with precision. And you might have to do it a few times and that's okay. It's like with anything else. But once you get those perfect proportions, once you really measured correctly and you know, don't put too much ice in your cocktail shaker and shake it for a really long time. So you get that nice foam that you see in these pretty pictures. The flavor is just unbelievable. Absolutely outstanding. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for your explanation of science and whiskey and history and drinks. And, and this has been really fascinating. I, I really appreciate your time and your expertise. Thank you for having me. I, I love telling the story and I appreciate um, anytime anyone wants to talk about the science too. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Um, thank you. And yeah, thanks for appearing on our podcast. Absolutely. Thanks for listening. And please let us know what you think. If you learned something today or if you have any questions or suggestions, please send us an email. Our address is info at cybarpodcast.org. And I'll put that in the episode notes too. If you'd like to help keep these podcasts and our online events free for everyone, we'd be grateful for donations of any size. I'll put links to how to make a one-time donation and also how to support us on Patreon, also in the episode notes. Finally, I want to say thanks to the podcast Gastropod and the creators Cynthia Graber and Nicola Twilley. I first heard about this story in their episode, The Secret History of the Slave Behind Jack Daniel's Whiskey from January 2019. Gastropod looks at food through the lens of science and history, and they have fascinating stories about things like the most dangerous fruit in America and what's CRISPR doing in our food. Check them out at gastropod.com. As always, thanks to my producer Graham Tully for making us sound good and to Jonathan Colton for the use of his song Mandelbrot Set for a theme music. And why are you one badass fucking 